All right. So if you are on and you can hear me, if someone can just say hello and say, I can hear you, that would be great. That would be awesome um, because I can't stand technology and I always think of the worst. So hopefully you can all hear me. And then I'm just going to jump right into this live. Um, and let's see here. I'm just checking here to make sure that we are all good. And I am going to get started here. So um, again, my name is Krista. I am a full-time artist specializing in portrait painting. And I wanted to do these live sessions. So a um, couple reasons why. One, because I just love sharing my process with everyone. And also um, I have a workshop coming up and I just wanted to provide um, a little teaser or a little peek into what you would expect in my workshop. So that's why um, I wanted to get on here and kind of go over, um, you know, sharing how I begin uh, the process of a portrait and how I work through it. And um, so that maybe you learn a little bit. And if you want to learn a lot more, um, definitely join my workshop. It starts January 7th. It's called Painting Your Muse. If you have any questions, um, definitely put it in the chat. Let me know. Send me an email or so forth. Okay. So if you were with me last week, last Saturday, I started this painting. I went through the process of beginning my underpainting. I was using uh, just burnt sienna, that was it, and some gamsol, mineral spirits. And I just kind of started. I started the movement in creating the shapes, the larger shapes, and then uh, focusing on those, you know, the shapes that are inside that larger shape. And I didn't get too far. I didn't do too much, but um, I returned and I worked on it a little bit more. So what I did was I started incorporating some titanium white so that I can really lock in to the light and so that I can visually see um, the information of the shadow and the light. And so I worked on this and I, uh, you know, it, at some point, because I didn't draw it, because I was just kind of going in there with the brush, you know, I have to step back and I have to see where I'm going. Am I, is it off? Am I losing proportion? Am I losing the likeness? Am I losing what I want to say in the painting? Is the composition getting off? Is the facial structure going off? So, um, and this is something I'm going to go into depth in the workshop in January. But what I do is I do like a little comparison and it's gotten so dark in here, but I, I don't want the light, the light messes with the camera. Um, but I do a comparison. So I take a picture of this. I put the reference photo next to it and I start comparing. And I do this in Photoshop. I'll do it in Procreate. Um, I do it on my phone. And I have this process that I use that I compare the reference photo with what I did and I I can see where I'm off and where I need to make adjustments. So um, that's something I learned by taking online classes, how other instructors, you know, critique and give feedback on your work is they put your work and the reference photo side by side and they help you visualize where your struggle is and help you visualize what you need to adjust and change. So that's what I did. Eventually I got here and this is where I have left off. Um, I haven't resolved anything going on here, but I'll get there. That's something. Um, but I wanted to get the information of the face on the canvas right away. I wanted that in there and the hand, which I struggle with. Um, so this is where I am. So where do I go from here? Well, usually I make sure that this is where I want it. Does it need to look exactly like the reference photo? No, that I don't usually um, stick to the reference photo 
to a T. Like I don't, st- I, I'm not tethered to that thing. Um, occasionally, you know, I, I just kind of let stuff happen and I use the reference photo as support and guidance. Um, am I looking to get the exact likeness from the reference photo? Not all the time. You know, I don't set myself up, set myself up uh, for that all the time. Now, I recently did a portrait of, um, and if you've been on online, and um, he's definitely popular online. A lot of artists do paint him. His name is Rick Nice. My last portrait I did, and it was a male. I've never painted a male portrait, um, but uh, and he, online he's called Rick the Muse. And I painted him and I wanted to get his likeness. It was very important that I got his likeness. So I worked really hard to make sure I was following the reference photo. Now, uh, what's great about him, and I'll, I'll tag him or put his information in the description for the replay, is he purposely takes reference photos for artists. So all of his photos are geared and designed for you, the artist, it's he definitely develops a lot of shadow and light, and he gives you a lot of information in his photos. So you don't have to take artistic license, so to speak. Um, and that's what he does. And so I wanted it to look exactly like him. I wanted everybody to know that's who I painted. So my primary goal was to copy that photo. But most of the time, even when I do my self-portrait, I'm not interested in copying the photo. I just want to get the general essence, the feeling, the composition, the story. There's something about the reference photo that I like, like this one, um, and I'll put it up in a second, um, that I want to tell on this canvas. So that's why. Um, but I don't, I, I don't set myself up to say it has to look exactly like the photo. I just want to... I want to capture the essence or maybe the um, the expression or or whatever is happening in the photo that I that made me gravitate to that photo initially. So I make sure it's where I want to be now. This, if I put up the reference photo, I don't think I, I mean it looks like my friend Alicia, but I don't think it's perfect to the photo. But while I was working on this, I got an expression that goes even deeper than the reference photo. And I kind of like it. So I'm going to stick with it. I'm sticking with this. I like where this is going. And the reference photo did not give me information about what was happening here. And it doesn't give me any information about what's happening here. So I have to use my imagination and I've got to create an environment here and here. Um, so a lot of times reference photos don't give you enough information and you got to kind of work through it to make it a composition. So that's in this case um, is what's happening. So um, here's my reference photo. I printed out three copies. So what I before I go into where I go next, um, I just wanted to do a quick little um, discussion of reference photos and how I use them. Um, again, uh, let's talk about where I get reference photos because I think that's I think when you're just starting out, one of the things I struggle with was where do I find people to paint? Um, and I think it's a good discussion because I've I've found places to get people to paint. Um, if you've been following me, I've been painting myself because it's easy. It's a great learning, a great way to learn how to paint portraits. And I'm free and I'm easy to paint. I'm always available. <laughs> um, there's a few online uh, royalty-free places where you can get reference photos. I've used Unsplash. Um, there's a, a app. Um, that called Sketchy that I've used, uh, where people will take selfies of themselves and they ask you to paint them. They, you know, um, there's another one and I can't think of it. I'll put it in the description. There is another one, and these are sites where they're 
basically free to sign up and you can get access to reference type photos, all types of photos, landscapes, uh, for advertising, for marketing and so forth. Um, my issue with getting reference photos from those places is that's where everybody else is going. So if you're going to paint one of those paintings, you're going to paint one of the, the photos, you and it's a good photo, you best believe there's another artist and another artist and another artist that's painted that same, um, that painting. So those sites are great for practice, but if you want to take it to a step further and you wanna you know, put your painting in a show or a gallery, or you, or you just wanna go to that next level, um, you kinda wanna change it a bit. <laughs> Um, and take a little bit more artistic license so that it isn't like the photo perfectly. So where else do I get reference photos? Um, here's a place, and I've been utilizing this, and this is a great idea, um, especially uh, after COVID, right? This is a great idea because I don't have access to live models. Um, and I'll, I'll tag the information but you don't have to live in the area to access it. Um, and I really want to share it because I, I tried it and it was awesome. So there's, they're on Instagram. Uh, it's called Gallery Girls. And that's their Instagram. I think that's their Instagram handle. And what it is, is they're based in Los Angeles, but don't worry about it. And you can, they do live, like you can go to a certain studio and paint live with them, but they broadcast live through Zoom and they have the model live in the Zoom and you can paint from, you can sketch, you can paint. Um, usually it's a couple of hours, maybe three hours that the model sits there and they have a different model all the time different poses, different, um, uh, like they dress up in, in different outfits sometimes. And it's usually a long pose. Sometimes they do quick poses, so they change every 10 minutes or so. Um, but it's a great opportunity, one, to practice sketching and painting from a live model, even though it's over Zoom, it's fine. Um, and it's just a great way. I don't have access to a, a art school or a art studio where I live to get um, to sit in front of a live model. So this is a great opportunity. And when I say it doesn't matter if you, you're not on the West Coast, there were people on the Zoom call that were called dialing in from Germany. Um, so a lot of people know about it. And it's really cool. And so usually it costs about $10 or $15, I think. And if you want to take a screenshot of the models, that sometimes they ask you to tip the model and provide them with, you know, a tip, uh, some, you know, money to, you know, so because you are screenshotting and you're utilizing their photo for your painting. So that great way to get access to a live model. And what's great about it is that these are professional models. Not they're not fashion models. They're professional, you know, models that sit for artists. So they know how to pose, they know how to stay still, they know how to with lighting and so forth and it is a great great opportunity to be able to practice and also get a reference photo, a, a, a subject for your painting. Um and then friends. I I ask friends and then sometimes I will see somebody online, another artist and I will reach out to him and say, "Can I paint you?" Um I do that too. So I'll provide the information about gallery girls in the description. Um, I think it's just a great way to, to get a reference photo. Okay. So I just wanted to share that. Let me check time. Okay. We're good. All right. If you have any questions, definitely ask them. Um, you know, ask questions in the chat. I'm right here. I can see it, you know, even though I don't have my glasses on, but 
So let's talk about my reference photo. This is my friend, um, Alicia, and this is the color. I'm gonna put it up into the screen so you can see, cause I wanna talk about each one. So this is the color version of the reference photo. Do I, did I get the likeness? I, I, yes and no. I think, I think right here is a little different, but I'm okay with that. And you notice that I only have this, I'm actually adding more information uh, to this, to this uh, subject here. But this is the color photo. And then last week I worked off the black and white photo. And let's take a look at the color in the black and white photo right here. And again, I'm gonna, in the workshop, I go into depth into this. Um, and I do this exercise all the time. So if you've taken Life Book or Let's Face It with me or are going to in 2024, I think I go over this over and over again. But let's take a look at the color in the black and white. And the color gives you a lot of information. There's a lot going on there. But look at the black and white version. It simplifies what you're seeing. It gives you less information and just gives you what you need to get here, right? It takes away a lot of the chatter is what I call it and just lets you see the values for what they are, just the values and the shape. That's all I care about. So I didn't even pick this up last week. I just worked off the black and white. And when I was working here, I just worked off the black and white photo. I'm going to introduce another way to look at your reference photo. There's two apps that I use on my iPhone. I don't know what's available for Android or the other. I have an iPhone um, and I will write them down. They'll be in the description. Um, one is called Value Study and the other I use is called uh, Poster Shine. So Value Study and Poster Shine. Now, what do these apps do? Um, these apps, you upload the photo, either color or black and white, and it gives you uh, what's called a posterized view of your photo. And what does that mean? So I'm going to put this up here and then I'm going to show you the black and white so you can see. So what it does, let's see if you can see it, because this photo doesn't get, it's, it's not giving a lot of info there. But if you look at it, you can see these chunks of values here. And basically it cuts up almost like a color by numbers or a puzzle. And it breaks down the values into these shapes that are easily, you can visualize them a lot better. So let me put up the black and white one. And let's compare. I'm going to fill the screen with it. And let's see if you can see it. So if you can look closely, <laughs> you can see that there's the black and white right here. And you can see that everything's kind of soft and smooth over and blended. But this one is giving really like these chunky values, right? You can see all these like little shapes going on. And I use all three of these as I move forward. This is really helpful because this helps me see where the values go. It helps me see in a easily, an easier translatable way. And it helps me see the light. It helps me see the dark shapes. And it just helps me translate what's happening here and what's happening in the color. Helps me translate this information a lot easier onto the canvas. Um, so this is one thing that I go into depth in the um, in the workshop, um, this also helps me if I'm struggling with drawing um, a a portrait, a certain subject, because it just simplifies everything. And you can in the app, you can simplify this even more. You can break this down into just two or three values 
it's and simplify it to the point where you're just seeing the dark and light shapes and maybe the mid-tone shapes. It looks pretty abstract, but it is a great way to get as much information as you can from the portrait that you're painting. And it, to me, it just makes it a lot easier to see what I need to see um, than going kind of working through this because I can't, I can see stuff, but I can't really, really see it. Um, so, and I'll use all three of these reference photos to help me navigate and get through my portrait. Um, so uh, if you have any questions or you want to learn more about this, this will definitely, I'll definitely be talking about it in the workshop. Um, I also talked about it. I did a live with Kara Bullock for Let's Face It. I'm going to get my classes right. And I talked about it there as well. I think I went in. I don't know. I don't remember what I said in that live, but I did go into it a little bit more in depth in that live there. So you can go to Kara Bullock. I don't know if you you have to be, I don't know if you have access to the live if you're not signed up for it. I'd have, I'd have to check, but um, it's something I talk about a lot in whatever I'm teaching. Um, okay, so that's the reference photo. Let's talk about my palette. And again, um, my palette has grown through the years. I like using this glass palette right here. It's from New Wave. Um, and I have them in different sizes. This is the nine by, I think it's nine by 12 size. I like this small size, even though it's not giving me a ton of space, but I like to have my palette sit right up on my canvas, right there. I don't like to look down and up. I like it to be right there and I like to mix. Um, doesn't always work. I always, sometimes it falls. Um, I would love to have some contraption that sits here. I kind of do, but um, it's not as, you know, I, I just, I enjoy it here. So, uh, so if I'm, if the space issue, I'll have another palette maybe down below here if I need more space, but um, I like to have it right here so that I'm mixing and I've, I've got the color right up against the canvas. It's just, it's, you know, I don't like to look up and down. I also like to have the reference photo. So I will tape up my reference photo um, all around <laughs> so that I'm, you know, and I'll move it around so that I'm not looking up and down. I'm just looking straight at the canvas and I have all, all I need right in front of me. Um, I just find that it makes it a lot easier to uh, move forward and navigate um, through the process. All right. So my palette. I'm always scared to. Um, and if you notice here, I've got a ton of colors on here. And if you've taken a class with me um, before, I'm, I'm usually a very pro limited palette. Um, and I think if you've done a Fantastic Faces with me, I introduced the Zorn palette, uh, which is just, I think it's just four colors. Four or four? One, two, three, four or five colors, four, just four colors, sorry. Um, and you can get a lot of range from a very limited palette. And why do I like promoting a limited palette? I like promoting a limited palette for beginners, people who are just starting out, because um, it's a lot easier to make decisions. When you've got a palette filled with all these colors, You've got to make decisions, especially if you're working in acrylic and you don't have a lot of time. You've got to get going. Paint's drying, right? Um, so you need to get to your color and you need to get to it quick, right? So limited palette, if you're just starting out, if you're new to oil paint or new to portrait painting, I suggest just getting four colors and working and learning how to work with those four colors. And I'll let you know what I like in a second. Um, and then this ha all happened just by experience. Me uh, expanding. I started with four colors and then I started, ooh, well, I like this color when I do this. And I like using this red when I do that. And I like using this blue when I need this. 
Um, so each color on my palette, I'm not going to go through this full palette. I'm just going to talk about a limited palette. But I will dive deeply in this entire, you know, the colors that I've chosen um, in the workshop. And I'll, I'll go through each one and the why, <laughs> why I chose it and why I like it. But um, so this, but this has expanded just from me expanding my practice. But uh, here's some really good four color uh, portrait painting uh, mixtures or, or paints palettes that you can utilize. The Zorn palette, which is titanium white, yellow ochre, cadmium red, and ivory black. And you can get a lot of range from the Zorn palette. Um, you can use the primaries, titanium white, um, a yellow, um, a red, and a blue. And that yellow could be cadmium yellow, medium or light. It can be the red can be cadmium red and the blue could be ultramarine blue. So if you're just starting out and you go to the art store and you've got like a ton, there are like, you know, there's so many different reds. There's so many different yellows. There's so many, di there's so many different um, tubes of paint. Um, this, I'm just going to share with you my philosophy on picking the palette, picking your palette. Um, and there's things that you should consider, really. I don't buy student grade uh, oil paint or acrylic. Um, acrylic paint, I will stick with golden. I will stick with Liquitex. I will stick um, with a brand of acrylic that I know um, won't be watery, that stays consistent, um, and so forth. So those are the brands, some of the brands that I like. There's others that I like as well, but those are the main ones. Oil paint, I stick with Windsor Newton, Gamblin, um, and there's others, but those are kind of reasonably, reasonably priced. Um, but Gamblin is probably my go-to. So the price right? And then different colors have different prices. The cadmiums are really expensive. They're really, so there's other alternatives to those cadmium colors that are a little less expensive and a little less of a, an initial investment. So those are things you take into account when you're choosing your palette colors. But when I choose my four colors, I choose a red, I choose a um, yellow, and then I have my two anchor colors, my neutrals. So that would be my white and it would be a dark. So I have, again, I have a yellow and a red. I have a white and I have a dark. Now the white is usually always titanium white. The dark can be anything. It can be ultramarine blue, burnt umber, um, it can be viridian green. It can be anything. Ivory black. It just has to be a dark. And then my yellow and my red could be anything. It could be yellow ochre. It can be cadmium red, cadmium yellow light, cadmium yellow medium, cadmium Naples yellow, Hansi yellow. I mean, there's tons of yellows. Um, each one is going to behave differently. My reds could be cadmium red, cadmium red light, alizarin crimson, Quinacridone red, uh, scarlet red, <laughs> I'm running out of the names, whatever. So, but as long as I have a yellow and a red and I have my, I call them my anchors, my white and my dark. Think of the Zorn palette. You've got yellow ochre, cadmium red, the anchors, titanium white and ivory black. So you're getting the pattern of what's happening. Primary colors, you've got your yellow, you got red, and then you got your anchors, white and blue, right? So you're, if you're understanding where I'm going, there's a pattern to choosing colors. And then everything else, you just expand upon it. You expand upon the reds, you expand upon the yellows, you expand upon the blues. Maybe you want to add a pre-mixed green. Maybe you want to add some 
more opaque colors, or maybe you want to do some glazing, add some transparent type colors. That's how you expand. I know I'm rushing and I'm going quick, but it's something that, you know, people don't think about. Like, you just like, what paint colors do I use? I don't know. Um, and you just kind of work with whatever an artist tells you to. And then you're kind of like, well, what do I do with them? <laughs> and what are they for? Um, so it's something that's, you know, I like to teach and it's taken me a while to get to this point. I've, I've got a box of oil paint, a box of acrylic paint, because I just want to experiment and try different combinations of yellows and reds and adding the two anchors, the white and the dark to see if it's giving me what I want. Whew, that was a lot. If you have any questions, I'm going to really deep dive into that and do a full demo of that in the workshop, because I think it's very important. And it's one of those type of discussions that you can put that type of discussion on your bookshelf bookshelf and refer back to it whenever you need when you need that support when you when you're trying to develop your palette so i feel it's really important um and i don't we you know a lot of artists will just kind of demo and just kind of show you what they're doing but a lot of times you're not you don't know why they've chosen that color they just like it but i have a why for every color that i've chosen on here um so what am I going to use for my block-in? This is the next phase for this painting is the block-in. Um, and I'm just going to block in color. I haven't even gotten to the painting, but this is how I work. I sit here and I take my time in this part of the process. Um, and I did want to add, if you do want to see me do a little bit of work of how I got here. I did put a YouTube short on there. So if you go to my channel, you'll see it on there. And I'll do the same after, after today. So what colors am I going to be using? Um, I'm going to use my, my, you know, four, but I'm going to change it up a bit. Um, and so I've got my red and my yellow, but my red and my yellow are just going to be, um, cadmium orange. So I've already got my, that's my red and my yellow. It's already mixed. Um, if you can see that there, and I'm going to make it closer here. <sighs> right. So I've got my red and my yellow, my red and my yellow is going to be the orange. And then my anchors, I've got the titanium white. And right now I'm just, oops, let me put it up here. I'm just kind of mixing. I'm going to mix a mid-tone, like a mid. So I'm going to have a light, a mid-tone, and a dark. That's what I want on my palette here. So I've got my anchor. I've got my titanium white. And then I need my dark. So I think, hmm, I think I'm, I was going to go with burnt sienna, but let me just do some burnt umber. So burnt umber will be my dark. And so... I'm just going to mix that together. If you can get, I'm going to get close so you can see it here. And I want to mix. So I've got the, my red yellow, which is the cadmium orange, which is red and yellow, right? I've got my two anchors, my, um, my titanium white, and I've got my burnt umber, which is right over here. And I mix those together. I'm just trying to get a, just a neutral color, just a neutral mid-tone color. So if I want to lighten it, I'm going to move to the titanium white and I'm going to add titanium white and let me wipe my brush here. And then I'm looking at my midtone and, you know, maybe it's too orange. Maybe that cadmium orange is really, it's really like it's shocking. And I just want to, I want to calm it down a bit so I can go and add just a little bit more of the, the, um, burnt umber. I hope I said that burnt, I'm using burnt umber. I hope I didn't say burnt sienna. Um, so the burnt umber, basically what it does is it will neutralize this bright, bright orange. 
And so, and then I can add some more. Is it getting too dark? I can add a little bit more white to it to get it to where I want it to be. And then I want a dark. And I'll take my cadmium orange and I'll just, no white, and I'll take my burnt umber and I'll mix that together. It's a very warm, comes out to be this really warm dark. So it's just basic, basic. Um, I've got my dark, I've got my light, and I've got a little mid-tone going in there. Is this perfect to her skin tone? Um, no, not quite, but I'm going to start, I'm going to start there. Now I can use this just as my base and I can sometimes, especially with my skin tone, um, I have a lot of green in my skin tone that I see. So sometimes I'll add other colors in my palette. I'll stay, start really, really simple. And then I'll enhance. Maybe I need, maybe this is too warm and I want to cool it down a bit. Maybe to cool it, I can add some ultramarine blue to cool it down. That's why when I said, when you develop your palette, you should understand the why for each color, why you have it on your palette and what do you use it for? Um, so my why for ultramarine blue is, uh, I'll share that is it's a great mixing color and it's a great neutral color and it cools things as well. Um, it's a great color to create shadow. Um, so it has its purpose and that's what it's for. Um, I'll share one more. Let's see. What's up? Um, Let's see. Let's do yellow ochre. Why do I like yellow ochre? Well, yellow ochre is a great um, yellow and red. It's a great yellow for my yellow and red theory, <laughs> um, especially for a darker skin tone, but even for lighter. Um, I like yellow ochre because of that, but I also like, like yellow ochre because it is a great um, complement to some of my darks, especially like the ivory black or the ultramarine blue. And remember I said that sometimes my skin tone is a little green and I can get a nice earthy green out of that yellow ochre, um, more so than I can if I'm using a cadmium yellow or a Hansa yellow or whatever. Um, so I like the earthy green that I get from that. So that's why it's there. Um, so again, never put a color on your palette unless you know why, the why, why are you using it and what's it for? Um, and that's why I like to stress for beginners, <laughs> use a limited palette, a red, a yellow, a white, and a dark. Um, so that you don't have to make all those decisions. Like you can, you can grasp four colors and figure out the why for each one. And then you can just slowly introduce other colors to help you get to your, you know, where you want to be. All right. So I'm just going to, I'm going to add some paint. I'm going to finally add some paint, um, to my, <laughs> to my, um, painting here. So I've got, let me carefully put this on my easel here. Let's see if I can so I get the hole. And when I'm in this part of the process, what I'm doing is I'm just blocking in um, and I'm still thinking in my head, large shape. I'm thinking large. I'm not, you know, I have, um, this is a, size four round brush. This is like a bristle brush, which I like, you know, I like using a larger brush to block in. I also like using flat, um, flat or filbert brushes to block in. Um, and I like when I'm in this stage, I like using my um, posterized view because it simplifies everything. And I'm just seeing the value shapes. And all I do is 
in the beginning, I just kind of make these little marks. I'm not painting. I'm not, you know, when I say I want to block in, it's, I'm going to take my time here um, blocking in and I'm not going to overdo it. I'm going to slowly, I'll make a mark and then I'll stop and then I'll move on, look at my reference photo and say, okay, where else do I go? I'll make another mark. Um, and I'll work this way. Um, sometimes here's a great, uh, you know, if you have trouble doing this, you know, make a mark, put a timer on, make a mark and then force yourself not to like put a timer on for like, I don't know, 30 seconds or 40 seconds. And so only make one mark every 30 or 40 seconds. Right. So that forces you to continually look, step back and look at what you're doing. Try not to get your head caught up in the canvas and not lift it up. And then all of a sudden you, you see you, you've lost the form and shape. Because I spent a lot of time here building this shape. You can see the shape here. You can see the shape of the face. You know that this is, you know, at a different angle than this, right? And so I spent a lot of time, I don't wanna lose that shape by just covering everything up. So I just make marks. Occasionally what, what is really perfect if you can is to have three brushes, <laughs> a dark brush, a light brush, and a mid-tone brush. I always forget what brushes I have in my hand, um, but again, I'm gonna make a lighter, <laughs> a lighter version of this. Um, I'm just going to add more white and just kind of move some of this color from here. And I just have a really light, light, light version there because a lot of this highlight here is pretty bright. So back to my brushes. Sometimes I get into a zone and I, um, I forget that I use the wrong brush. So, um, but if you have that discipline, get three brushes, three of the same brush. I don't have three of the same brush. And um, designate one for dark, one for light, and one for um, the mid-tone. <laughs> see if that works there. And then try to only use it for its purpose. <laughs> it will prevent you from getting really, really muddy. It will prevent, if you're using a different brush for each value, it will prevent you from getting muddy and uh, contaminating the dark or the mid-tone or whatever. So you get a much cleaner block in if you have a different brush for each value um, there. So um, I don't, I always forget but it's definitely, if you can, definitely um, do that. <laughs> so I have a little bit of safflower oil, just a touch. I'm not using a lot. And I'll just go in and I've got my light. I've got my kind of light and I got my mid-tone and I got my dark. And I'm just going in there, just making marks. I don't know what size this brush. This is a round brush. This is a size four, two. Wow, Dif difference in brushes. Both of these are size four, right? One smaller than the other. Um, so I guess size doesn't, you know, it's, it depends on the brand. <laughs> and I'm just taking a look and just adding marks. I'm not trying to paint. Um, let me move that out of the way there so you can see the whole thing. I'm just taking a look and just making some marks. Let me get my mid-tone. Oh, this one's even smaller. Oh, this will work. Let's go in with some mid-tone marks. I'm going to add a little. Actually, I don't, I'm not a big fan of this brush. Let me use... Let me get this one. Actually, this one is maybe a little too small. Let's use this here. 
this one is, um, oh, this might be a size four too. I can't see. Um, brushes I like using, the brand of brushes I like using are, um, this is, I like the Windsor Newton Monarch line. And I love uh, Tracal brushes. Those are the two brushes that, and I also actually know, um, I like these. <laughs> these are from Dick Blick. These are the Scholastic Wonder White brand of brushes that I really, really like. They're very inexpensive. They don't last forever, but they do what they need to do. So I buy them in bulk. Um, and sometimes it comes a lot cheaper than one of these. So um, I like these. I get um, the, the size one rounds. I buy them in bulk. I get a, like 20 of them. And I they don't last forever, but they are great. I like using them. Okay, back to painting. You see, there's so much. That's why I like doing the workshops because there's so many things I like to cover and there's so many things to um, talk about. <laughs> I'm gonna add a little bit of the safflower oil and I'm just gonna go in, take a look, just look closely and I'm just gonna make some marks. Now, mind you, I already did a lot of the work. I did a lot of the work already in the underpainting. Um, so all I'm doing is I'm going to mix some more because I didn't mix enough. I think that works. Um, so I don't need to reinvent the wheel here. I just need to um, continue where I left off, now adding color. Now, sometimes um, another way that I do um, an underpainting is I'll actually, I might do a, um, I'll do like, I'll sketch it with some burnt sienna or burnt umber. And then I will do all this with black and white paint. So I'll do like a grayscale underpainting. And then what I do is I might do some glazing and that glazing is basically taking, um, cause I do have a few uh, colors that are more transparent. India, Indian yellow, I've got the alizarin crimson as well. And I will glaze color over certain areas to get to start building up depth. Um, so um, those are other ways. There's so many different ways to approach approach this that it can be overwhelming. Um, but um, I change it up every so often so I don't get bored. So I will try, I'm always open to trying different ways of doing things. Where's my dark here? So I'm gonna try to hold three brushes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, I always, I always end up messing up, but one day, and I'll just stick here. I'll stick with this light, dark, mid-tone um, palette. I won't start messing with other colors until I get more deeper into the painting. I just do a block in with a simple light, a dark, and a mid-tone. And remember when I said I see some green, sometimes I get some green in my face. Um, uh, in my face, just from me studying it, I can see a lot of green tones um, in my skin tone. So usually sometimes um, what I'll do is I'll, I've got my, this is um, right here, this bright green. This is permanent green light. I like using that one. Um, and maybe I'll just take a little tiny, tiny bit and I'll add it to my mixture on the side there. Little, little bit. So then all of a sudden it gets this kind of greenish uh, tone to it. And I have like, there's a lot of green. Usually there's a lot of green down in here in the jaw area. And I will kind of add that to 
uh, various areas as well. I might even take the full on green. Let me get some, this, my green is a little dried up and I might go in there. I know it's hard to see. Um, and I might even go in there with just straight up green, if you can see that. I, I just might even, just to indicate, um, and just a very small mark. And I'll just kind of go in and just make some very small little marks. But to me, those small marks, they mean a lot. They, they are, they, they're, they're helping me tell the story, right? Without getting all deep into it because I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose what I did and I want to maintain, I always have a paper towel to wipe my brush. Um, I've already started mixing brushes. I want to maintain the form and shape that I developed in the underpainting. I don't want to lose that. So I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to slow down a bit to make sure I don't lose that. Um, so in the beginning, you don't see a whole, you're not really doing a whole lot. You're just kind of, um, you're just kind of moving around. You notice I'll go to different areas to make a mark. Also, what I like to do is sometimes I want to create another value. I'll, I'll add just a little bit of the dark to my mid-tone to just um, change it, change the value just a bit. I might can do it on the other way around. Add a little of the light to my mid-tone as well. So at this point in the process, I'm not making any major, major decisions. I'm just working off of what I've already done. Um, and it's a slow process. And I don't, I purposely try not to pick up smaller brushes like this. Uh, this, this is a size six too. These are... <laughs> This is the problem when you say, okay, get all size six brushes, but every brand and make has a different, oh no, actually this is a size, this is a size four and this Blick is considered a size six. So <laughs> it's not like I can say, just get all size four brushes or size six because every brand's version of a size six is very different. This is a little small, right? Compared to this size four. What I'm trying to say is I try not to pick up and let me go get one. I'm going to grab one so you can, you know, I try not to pick up. This is really small. This is a size zero. <laughs> I try not to pick up those type of brushes to the very end, because if I start picking up these now, I'm going to start, I'm going to lose this, you know, the, the block in, and I'm going to start doing these tiny, tiny, tiny little details. And I'm still not, I, I'm not worried about eyelashes. This is why I like to use the posterized view because I'm just seeing the, the shapes. All I want to do is the shapes. I might even find a, a size eight brush to block in this area too. Let me see where we are with time. Are there any questions um, that anyone has about what I've done. I know I didn't do a lot of painting today, but I did a lot of talking and I did, I tried to provide a lot of information that is really helpful um, in, you know, my, you know, finding out my why, why do I do certain things or why, um, why am I doing this or that? You know, why am I using, why am I picking up this color and not the other? Um, I think, you know, it's one thing for me to sit up and do a demo for an hour or two, but um, sometimes you just need to understand the why, because then why, you know, you need to find a reason why you would go to your own easel and do that same thing. I've already contaminated my colors. <laughs> so I admit, I struggle with the three brush thing. 
So I'll work through here. I'll do another little quick little video. I'll post it on YouTube um, to see um, the rest of me blocking in this face area. Um, but this will take me, let's see, I'm going to try to gauge if I work on this for the rest of the day, I'm going to say this would take me a couple days working maybe three or four hours. Um, and I will spend that much time here because it's important. And the beginning stages, what my goal is in painting a portrait or even a landscape or whatever you're painting is that you put all the, the grind, <laughs> the hard work, you get it you get it out of the way and you spend more time in this developmental foundational process that when you're getting to that finished point of the painting, that all you're doing is picking up a tiny, tiny little brush and making tiny, tiny little marks um, for detail. And that is my goal. I never really want to be at that point of the process, that finished point. And now I've got to completely overhaul or, or adjust or change areas. I want all that to be set, finalized before I start picking up small brushes and doing any type of detail. Um, that's a goal. It doesn't always happen. It doesn't always happen. Um, but that is my goal through my process. I do stop a lot. Um, that's why I say make a mark, step back make a mark, step back, or um, step B, maybe about a couple, three, two or three feet away and reach out the brush, use the long handles and make marks from far away. Um, always step back and see what's happening because a lot of times what happens with me is I'll be painting, painting along, and then all of a sudden my eyes start shifting, 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 and all of a sudden it's all the way over here, and I don't see it. So always step back, observe, just make small marks. You know, don't make huge, big, giant decisions because small marks you can adjust. When you've put a lot of work into covering up an area, it's harder to adjust that later on. So. Um, I think we've hit the hour mark. Um, I hope all this information was helpful. I hope that you can gain just a little bit more information to help your practice. If you do want to learn more and you want to see me go deep dive into my palette, deep dive into reference photo and drawing and, and getting to this point and continuing on. Um, that's what my workshops are built to do. Um, I do do a demo, but I, I go off in a separate video and I, you know, really go into the why of my palette. Um, I talk about why certain, I use certain colors and how I use them. Um, I talk about the reference photo and how I use them. I talk about, um, you know, building up the foundation and how the different ways that how I do that. Um, and I plan to offer these workshops every month. Each month I'll focus on a different theme and different concepts and we'll explore different poses. We'll explore a, you know, a front facing view, three quarter view, a full figure, um, you know, different environments and so forth. So uh, it is definitely a, a workshop that is going to be built, one, for you to get feedback and an understanding of how to check your own work and see where you're, where you're off and what you need to improve upon. And also to have uh, information so that when you are, you know, not when you're watching a demo by me or someone else, but when you're at your easel and you get stuck, you have some place where you can go to get that information. Huh, I'm struggling with value. I'm struggling with you know, this or that, and you get information to help support and, you know, help you learn how to problem solve in your own creative practice. So I'm going to sign off. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, thank you for listening to me talk and talk and talk. Um, I'll provide, hopefully I remember 
All the information that I said I was going to provide in the description in the replay. Um, but I hope you join me for my workshop. Uh, if you have any questions, send me an email. Um, put a comment in the video. Uh, and if you want to learn more, definitely go to my website. And thank you for spending Saturday with me. I don't think I'm going to do this again. We're going into the holidays. So um, things are getting busy. But I might do it the week after. So if you're on my email list, you'll get a notice. Um, but thank you so much. Um, thank you for following. Thank you for your support. And I hope you have a beautiful holiday and new year. And I hope to see you all in January. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening this Saturday morning or afternoon, wherever you are. <laughs>